they used a little bit of magic and a pay no attention to the man behind the curtain aspect to help the the perception of the flow. Hi, I'm Russ. And I'm Danny. And this is the Memory Makers Podcast. The show focused on helping you create amazing customer experiences and make more memories. Memory Makers Podcast. Short, succinct. I like it. I'm going to take that vibe and we're just going to go straight into the topic today. Short and succinct. Uh, Talking about escape rooms, game masters, whatever you want to call the person that operates and runs your escape rooms. And today we want to talk about what are the characteristics that uh, an employee needs to be very, very successful in the role of operating an escape room. And there are going to be characteristics of this role that are similar to a lot of staffed attractions, but there are also some that are very unique to the escape room experience. And we're going to kind of uh, go between all those today. So, Russ, I'll throw it to you. Start off with the first one. What do you got? Well, you need a real fuddy-duddy who's not really looking to connect with your guests, you know? It's real important that you just have a real straight-faced, don't-give-a-hoot kind of guy or gal running that show, you know? I think that it, when I think about a successful es- escape rooms, it's really just flat-lined. I want no bloop, bloop on that heart rate monitor. Does that sound correct? I, I know. I can't get over the fuddy duddy. That's the thing that got me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. You know, that's just the random word jumble that is my brain. But, uh, but no, you want to have an engaged switched on cat. How's that one for you? Instead of fuddy duddy, Danny, you want to have someone who's going to engage with your guests and have fun. Um, I think one of the, the most important things to remember is that although escape rooms have been, Um, around for a while there's still plenty of folks who haven't done it and they need kind of to get their bearings as they go into an experience and so having somebody who is um, going to have a little bit of fun and break down some of the you know initial intensity just to get everybody relaxed and, and into a good flow state having somebody who's who's there to have fun with the guests and to help them succeed is going to be really impactful yeah Um, you know one of the things that, that we've we've talked about um, as well is um, this is not necessarily characteristic of the game master, but when it comes to escape rooms and, and the way that you approach how an experience goes with the guests, um, sometimes and early on in the escape room evolution when it first kind of came to the U.S., uh, there were a lot of standalone escape room businesses that were all about like we're going to make this as hard as possible. We want the lowest completion rate we can possibly get, make it super difficult. And then over time realize that, well, not everybody wants that. If they're paid mm-hmm. for the experience, like they want to feel like they're having a good time yeah. um, and being able to set it up where where most guests can at least get 80% of the way through, if not getting to completion. Yeah. You have their money already. Who's really won here? Okay. Let's let's not get caught up into the shenanigans of it. So um, I, go ahead. I do think sometimes there is a a difference in maybe customer perception too Mm -hmm. when they're going to be playing an escape room within a family entertainment center environment or if they're going to a standalone escape room business. Mm -hmm. I think their mindset around what those two experiences are will be slightly different as well. I think that um, some customers are going to expect a a higher level of difficulty if they're going to go to a standalone escape room business than they are maybe if they go to um, a family entertainment center environment. But it also depends on your brand and how you want to position the business in general. Yeah, absolutely. And I, there's some fun different things, you know, and even Mikey Mike, shout out, working the ones and twos over here, was talking to us about as we were doing some research on this. And, you know, there's there's different ways that you can have some cheekiness and some sassiness and, and some levity into the experience with how you engage your groups. Um, and so one example that he had, had passed on that I loved was, you know, when you're the game master, you know, you're telling the guests then, hey, when you have a question, you can't call me game master or master. You have to call me by a different name every single time in order to to ask a new question. And so one of the examples was like, goddess of death. What, how do we, how do we unlock this door and things? And, and in my head, you know, from, from previous operations and stuff like that, I'm like, oh, that sounds hilarious and great. And then I'm like, but you are going to have some rogue, you know, <laughs> some rogue characters who will maybe take too many liberties with that. But I love that concept of just, again, getting the 
to be present and teaching them how they're they're going to be staying focused on the entirety of the piece. So it was a really cool mental jujitsu thing that I really loved uh, as a, as a way to keep them engaged consistently with the game master or goddess of death, whatever you end up calling them. Um, that I really liked a lot from from an engagement standpoint. And you know the the next characteristic that is super similar to that, and I think segues really well, is high levels of emotional intelligence and the ability to read the customer. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a couple things that go into this. When it comes to the game master, if you have a group that's struggling, right? They're at a certain point and and they they've been stuck on the same clue for five, 10 minutes and they can't seem to, to figure it out. They might come off as we don't want to have clues and don't tell us what to do next but you can see they're clearly struggling and there's got to be kind of this ability to read them and know, well, maybe I can nudge them in the right direction without them feeling like I'm giving them the answer so they can Mm -hmm. get a little bit further, but without feeling like I'm spoon feeding it to them. So I think that there's that ability to understand what are the dynamics of the group? What are they saying they want, but Mm -hmm. what are, what is, uh, below the surface of what would actually make it a good experience for them, regardless of the words that are coming out of their mouths. I think there's a, a bit of a fine line that um, that game masters, really good game masters can kind of dance because a lot of times you want to be able to give a group a clue without saying, look in that drawer and find that key, right? Mm-hmm. That's not fun for anybody, but maybe you can sort of insinuate they need to go to a certain side of the room or give them some sort of metaphor to think about to to nudge them in the right direction. Yeah, and um, I think that one in, important aspect of this is there are times as we're talking with different operators and things where it's like, oh, I'm going to put my you know high-tech focused employee on this attraction and that is perfectly fine. It's not always necessary, especially if the the you know game design and the the horsepower underneath the the hood, so to speak, is is there and it's designed to be an intuitive experience. Y- you want to make sure that you have this blend of you know they need to have some technical savvy, but that's something that can be coached up, right? And so we talk about this opportunity of you know I can't teach somebody to run a four four forty. I can teach them how to run a route. Right. So I need to find somebody with some natural aptitude um, and and but also the right attitude, more importantly, in order to make sure that those things actually translate. So, you know, we've we've talked about this before, and this is not an escape room example, but I think it's a very good example of an employee's ability to kind of read the room and understand the group. And Mm -hmm. it's when um, all of us on the leadership team, we had kind of an afternoon training session then we went to dinner. And then after dinner, we went to uh, an ax throwing facility and we had as part of our lane, we had our own expert, as they called him. Mm -hmm. um, And his name was pork chop. That's what he said his name was. I don't know what his real name actually was, but he was pork chop. Um, and he could understand that we were we all knew each other really well. We were having fun. We uh, and so he was able to to really kind of lean into that a little bit, joke with us a lot, and make mm-hmm. the experience so much more than just, hey, I'm here to simply make sure that you know how to play each game and that you're following the rules and being safe. Yeah. Like anybody could do that, but he took the experience to a whole different level because of the way that he engaged with us. And he had that emotional intelligence to know, oh, this is a group that I can joke around with. Yeah. And I still smile every time that you bring up Pork Chop's name because of how much fun he allowed us and, and helped us have. Then, I mean, it was a great time. We would have had fun. It's cool. It's axe throwing for sure. But he definitely was one of the core takeaways of what that memorable experience was because of how he engaged and because of how he was you know having that you know meeting us where we were and tailoring his technique to us a little bit which was really cool but the other thing that he did that that just strikes me and I think that this is absolutely impactful for a um for an escape room or any attraction piece is that very clear communication skill right you want to make sure that they really understand hey here are the here are the do's, here are the don'ts, here's where you are going to need, you know, here, whether it's don't yank and pull on stuff that's in a fixed position because we don't have anything that's there, you know, you're helping, they're helping protect the investment, but that really clear communication style as well to, because especially if they've never done escape rooms and stuff before, the first time that they hear something, they're likely not going to hear all of it to the full extent that they need to. And so making sure that you've got someone who has got a little bit of patience with that and can clearly communicate, Hey, this is how we do this. This is how 
how, you know, this is what's going to help you. This is what's not going to help you. Um, things like that, which is, you know, again, not nothing revolutionary, but he did such a great job of, you know, consistently coaching and, and talking through with us of, you know, when we were trying to do stuff, he was also taking on that kind of caddy mentality on the golf course of, Hey, adjust this, do that. Hey, you're, you're letting this thing go way too late. Um, and so that communication skill where he was able to coach us a little bit in the experience was really, really cool too. When it comes to the communication skills, I think an important part of that for the escape room game master is that once the game starts and the guests are in the room and they begin that experience, the guests don't see the game master and not everybody thinks about this, but the level of communication and clarity that you need when the guests can't see you and you can't point to something mm -hmm. is really, really crucial because if I had five people in a room and I were to say, okay, look over there and, and no, the other way, no, find that thing that's sitting on the shelf. Like that's so yeah. unclear and unhelpful. Yeah. But if I wanted to be more clear and I say, Hey, uh, red shirt look to your right and on the shelf you're going to see a shiny object pick that up and look at the bottom mm -hmm. it's a much better way if i want to be a clear communicator uh, and that is a really important piece that i think not everybody thinks about the fact that you can't the guests can't see the game master even though the game master can see the guests because of the cameras yeah that's a, a great way to shorten the learning curve for sure because that can definitely create some friction points especially when you may have guests that are already a little irked that they're you know struggling with the room because it is you know maybe they had a lot of bravado and confidence going in and then uh oh this thing's a little tricky so you know the the emotional guard is going to be up a little bit more if they're like i, I don't which thing what thing? like yeah all of that communication skill and being very detailed and specific is a, is a great point for sure and i think to your point as well about being fluent in that game flow is understanding that whole decision tree or the different variables of how different props and puzzles and things interact the only way that you're going to get really fluent on that is by having your game masters repeatedly play the experience so they've got that down like the back of their hand right and so that way it is it is constant familiar and then they can be able to respond quickly and they're not trying to like oh shoot okay i gotta flip to page three what was the next thing and then oh okay like that was a, a technical issue so i need what's the override command key like they need to get reps under their belt they need to do some batting practice um in order to do a lot of sports analogies today we're really we're crushing the sports i feel good about me right now with that <laughs> but uh but what how are they really internalizing what that whole flow is so that way they can immediately be helpful uh, instead of creating some of those smaller friction points and, and just get to the good. And I will say, I think it's really important for when you are tra training somebody for the first time in, in escape rooms or if you just hired an employee, they should play the room first with zero context just like a guest should so that they can understand what it feels like to be a novice in that room and not really know what's supposed to happen next. And it gives them a little bit more empathy to when they are a game master go, oh yeah, I remember what it's like when they're in this position and it's kind of, they may not know if they need to go left or right or do this thing or do that thing next. I think being able to have that understanding of what it's like to be a beginner in that room and experience it for the first time with zero information is mm -hmm. super important. And then, like you said, get lots and lots and lots of reps so that they know the thing like the back of their hand. Yeah. And, and, and it's more than just once, you know, with that, like mixing up your group. So if you've got six people that are getting trained on it, you know, having them all go through multiple times and playing it and bringing in when you're doing some soft play and some tests and things like having them in those groups as well. So that way they can, because if you've got six people in a room and there are 12 different puzzles, like they haven't solved every single specific one. So if somebody else has solved a puzzle and they didn't see how that actually got there. They didn't have the context that gave them the know how to do that. Like there are escape rooms of ours that I've played multiple times where I'm like, holy crap, how does this puzzle actually, you know, like I'm trying to shortcut and go through the process and it doesn't help if I haven't actually gone through that as a novice multiple times to make sure that I really understand what that is. The last characteristic that you alluded to is, uh, just a moment ago is the ability to think on their feet and troubleshoot. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, no matter how good your escape room is from a quality and durability standpoint, there are sometimes going to be occasions where the guest 
does the thing they're supposed to do, but it doesn't actually trigger the next step appropriately. Mm -hmm. That will happen sometimes. It's just part of the nature with that many levels of electronics and triggers and the things that happen in the software. Mm -hmm. Your employee has to be able to, on their feet, manually override and go, they're doing the right thing. Let me trigger that next thing to happen and be watchful and wary of that because you don't want the guest to feel like, oh, this thing broke. It didn't work appropriately. It's not right. that it broke. Just sometimes the triggers aren't going to be 100% every single time. Mm -hmm. And their ability to, in the moment, just trigger so the guest has no idea that something went wrong, so mm -hmm. to speak, that is really, really important. Well, and not only that, but there are some times where you have like disposables or consumables that are part of the escape room where it's like, hey, we've got a deck of cards and on this deck of cards, like it's got a certain marking and a pattern. Well, if people are taking those cards and things over time, like that clue is not going to, you know, activate the same way or give the proper context for it. And so, you know, a great example that we were, you know, thinking of was, you know, had an operator, they were running a game the some you know they realized that the spare key from the previous group like someone from that group had taken the spare key like nobody could find it do any of that kind of stuff and so they they did a little bit of a, a you know jingling of the keys over here of like hey what's that over there kind of a thing and then like opened the door tossed in a spare key on the floor and they're like oh look it fell from the ceiling like they they used a little bit of magic and a pay no attention to the man behind the curtain aspect to help the the perception of the flow like what happens backstage like that's part of the magic of show is too so you need to feel confident and comfortable being able to lean into that as well it's all misdirection right <laughs> yeah yeah the, uh, think david copperfield okay just you're looking over here and bam i'm coming from you over here <laughs> but not as dramatic probably because then the show is going to be all about the game master but just as many sequins i feel like <laughs> okay so that i think is a really good place for us to kind of <laughs> wrap this up to put a bow on this the characteristics of what makes a great game master first engaging with the guests then there's the ability to have a high emotional intelligence to read the guest very clear communication skills fluent in the entire game flow of the room and the ability to think on their feet and troubleshoot if you can find someone who has the ability to do all those things that should be your game master and to me I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. Russ, what do you say? I say yay. So we've got more great episodes coming to you on a weekly basis. So be sure to check us out on that feed and, and get more insights from the different operators and, and guests that we'll have on the show. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. And always appreciate that five stars, please and thank you. If you've got ideas for topics or guests for future episodes, follow us on social media, send us a DM. Shout out as always to Mikey Mike on the ones and twos and work in the ultranet. And we appreciate you guys joining us and we will see you on the next one. And speaking of amazing customer experiences, uh, let's start over. I interrupted. I forgot you were going to do the band, <laughs> the, the jingle. Thank you from the You're top. Good. Memory makers. I was Ooh, feeling short, like a, a real nip. <laughs> you go first. One third. That's why they call us three take Russ and Danny. We're men. We're men in tights. Tight, 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 tight. tight, tight. <laughs> Do we want to start over? This yep. is this is way yep. off the rails. Yep. Nope, I got no response. You were going to go somewhere weird with it, you weren't did, you? And I had no no clear, yep, you done stumped me, Danny. I threw you a curveball on that, sorry. It ain't the first time, and, and Lord knows I've given you plenty as well, so. You were going to pull a Michael Scott of, sometimes I start a sentence and I have and no have idea, no where, idea where I'm going. <laughs> All right, let's do it to it, gang.